I will be summarising what we know about the people who set up the Newark Coal and Salt Company and those who worked for them and how they fitted into the wider economic and social picture. This area has a long history of intermittent coal extraction and salt production. Almost the final such enterprise was the Newark Coal and Salt Company, established in 1771. The partners arranged with Pittenweem Town Council to make improvements to the harbour to export their products, and the town held five shares in the company. We don't know what the total shareholding was. Nine salt pans were built between 1772 and 1774, by which time a wagonway had been built to Pittenweem. Production peaked in 1779, but lasted until 1794, when several things happened. Colliery production was hit by an over underground fire, so the company ended its agreement over Pittenweem Harbour, and the wagonway went out of use. The salt industry nationally was in decline, and exports were virtually at an end. It's also likely that after more than 20 years, the infrastructure may have been in need of capital investment, and one of the partners was thought to have been in financial difficulty. By 1799, both the partners had died. In 1802, the last dividend was paid, and the land Sir John had bought from Pittenweem Seabox was sold back to them. In 1803, the engine at the coal works finally stopped, and the last annual shareholders' meeting was held in 1807. But by that time, demand and prices rose in 1806, and the salt pans were again in production under new management between 1807 and 1813. But you could see on a much smaller scale. Thereafter, local landowners lost interest, despite pressure to restart coal production. The wagonway route was preserved for many years, just in case, serving as a lover's lane until part of it was reused for the Leven and East Fife Railway in 1865. The company was established by two partners, Sir John Anstruther of Ely and Newark, invested considerably in increasing his land holdings in East Fife, including in 1769 the estate of Kelly, which brought with it the superiority of Pittenweem, which had a much better harbour than St Monan's, and was larger, a royal borough and market town, and Sir John had his placemen already on the council. His partner was his brother-in-law, Robert Fall, merchant in Dunbar, there had long been close business relationships between the two sides of the Firth of Forth. Some places, for example, produced salt, others produced the barrels into which to put the salted fish. Among his many enterprises, Robert Fall built a tidal bathing pool, one of the first in Scotland, while Sir John built his wife a private changing room and pool below her summer house on Fife in Ely Ness. Below the two partners were the professionals, engineers and managers. In 1752, Gavin Hogg, Sir John's factor, was made an honorary burgess of Pitt and Weem. In 1772, Philip Brown, clo clerk to the coal company, was admitted burgess. At some point, Gavin Hogg stopped being Sir John's factor, but instead was the chief magistrate of Pitt and Weem for several years until his death in 1800. By this time, his successor as factor, Robert Maltman, was also serving on the council. Other names which survived, so, and Sir John was an honorary burgess, of course, as the superior of the feudal superior, so he really did have control of the council, so when I say he made a contract with the council, he made a contract virtually with himself. Um, other names which survive in this group of men include Ralph Sopwith, described in 1783 as engineer late at St Philip's Colliery. Sopwith is not a local name, and engineers often had to be brought in from other areas, in this case from Newcastle. From 1808 to 1811, production of salt was in the name of Robert Maltman, who we've met. 1810 to 1812, John Bain and Company, and 1813 to 14, John Body and Company. You note these overlap, which is clear indication that th these nine pans were being worked in smaller blocks. Um, John Bain was treasurer of Pitt and Weem, and in 1811, in going down to open or shut the sluice at the salt pans, was suffocated and drowned. About John Body and others on the screen, I know nothing else, but the names might match those from other salt pan sites. What about the workers? 
Excavation was mainly limited to the pans and wind engine, though two buildings were identified to the east, probably salt girnel and coal store, and the excavators suggested that there might have been space for accommodation above the four chambers of the pan houses. Although the statistical accounts do confirm that there was separate housing for workers close to the site. And this reconstruction drawing shows housing on the St Monan side of the site where the area below the raised beach is wider. But either it was quite flimsy or the stone was robbed because the first edition OS six inch map of 1855 shows the windmill on the pans but no roofless buildings. Although there'd been earlier salt pans here, at least some salters must have been brought in from elsewhere. Certainly the st statistical account for Pitt and Weem claimed that the population had increased very considerably within these 25 years, owing to the colliery and salt works. When production declined, presumably some had to leave the area to find new work. With nine salt pans, there would have been at least two men per pan plus overseers. Once the pans were established, there was a collector, supervisor, officer and two watchmen later increased to four. So perhaps 30 men, some with families, lived close to the pans, although according to the Minister of Dysart, the engine and salt pans occasion much smoke, which is very disagreeable, destroying vegetation in the gardens and penetrating the inmost recesses of the houses. The salt officer was paid £25 a year, the watchmen 15 the supervisor and the collector 5 We don't know what the salters earned, but they were paid piecework, so stoppages for repairs or bad weather would mean loss of income. And this must have made smuggling salt very tempting. Customs records tell us of 34 seizures by salt officers or watchmen from about 22 people, two-thirds of them women, mostly salters or their wives and daughters. Were women the main offenders or were they just less successful at evading discovery? I found a few names of salters. One family moved from Weems, one from Torryburn via Curros, and in the case of a third name, half its occurrences in Fife are in places with salt works. St Monan's was small and poor with a reputation for inbreeding, so it may be that an influx of salt workers provided new blood and at least partly explains the borough's rapid growth in the 19th century. A search of the Fife Deaths Index produced none for salters from St Philip's, apart from John Bain, but several other works, particularly Torryburn, had considerable number of deaths and there were single deaths from small other local places like Largo. So perhaps the St Philip salt pans were run well and safely. Um, I hope that we can start exchanging names and information between sites because there must have been movement of people between them. Thank you. So the, the monograph is out of print but available as a down, free download.